Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Colin Moriarty, Sacred Symbols, and Broken Pax Promises, A Lawyer's View. Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we have a rather unique episode, an episode that absolutely does reflect on the video game industry and on pop culture in general, but in a very specific way and not of general applicability and not generally in the news. Um, For a full disclaimer, uh, I have actually spoken uh, via email and Twitter to the principal on this particular question. Didn't talk about legal advice, just kind of got a little bit of a background for what was happening here uh, because I was interested in it. Uh, And uh, that person is Colin Moriarty, X of IGN, X of Kind of Funny, currently running his own Patreon, Colin's Last Stand, where he operates a show called Sacred Symbols, which kind of goes back to a bit of his roots, talking about PlayStation uh, with another uh, host, which I believe goes by the name of Chris Raygun, or Ray Gun. I don't know exactly how that's pronounced fully, uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, but he has a show uh, about PlayStation, and he had proposed to have that show be performed live at PAX West. Uh, PAX being the conference that was originally started up by the Penny Arcade folks, uh, and I believe they have a more hands-off approach to it now, and they run it through an an organization, company, uh, that goes by the name of Read Pop. uh, And Colin submitted a proposal to have a panel at PAX West. Now, before we get into the documents here, before we talk about uh, a little bit of the law that kind of runs adjacent to the issue that we are going to talk about, I want to give a brief disclaimer, as I said, I have contacted, I have talked to Colin electronically about these issues. This is not legal advice. Colin is not my client. Colin, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, this is not formal legal advice. As the disclaimer said, this is educational, this is informational. There are a lot more details that you would probably discuss with your counsel about what you might pursue if you decided to pursue anything on this. Uh, But for the purposes of virtual legality, I think there are some unique legal concepts that we haven't gotten a chance to talk about entirely in this space. And so I want to take an opportunity with your fact pattern, with the events that have happened in respect of this panel to talk about them uh, with my viewers and with my listeners on my podcast. And uh, Colin has given me permission to do so. Uh, So without further ado, let's take a look at the email that Colin received that accepted his proposal to have a panel at PAX. Um, So I've got a copy of this email that Colin forwarded to me. It's dated July 11th, 2019, so just about 20 days ago, give or take. Colin, congratulations, your panel, Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast live, has been accepted. We tentatively have you scheduled for Monday, September 2nd at 1130 a.m. in the Hydra Theater. Feel free to tweet, blog, podcast, and let the world know that you will be attending. It is by no means a secret. This theater will be streaming via Twitch TV, and by confirming your attendance via email, you are consenting to have your PAX panel content broadcast. The Hydra Theater is located in the Grand Hyatt, and the Raven Theater is located in the Hyatt Regency. Please confirm your attendance via email and any updated details below by end of business on Tuesday, July 16th. So that's an important date as well to keep in mind. That's two weeks ago. PAX had asked Colin uh, and his co-host to confirm the details of their panel by about two weeks ago. And we'll get to the bottom of this email. They'll say exactly why they need it then. But that was an important date for finalizing what their show was going to be. It says, in addition, we will require an on-site, con- uh, an on-site contact number for each panel. Uh, we have the following title and description, which I will read. It says, Sacred Symbols is the Internet's most beloved PlayStation podcast, but it's always recorded behind closed doors. Until now, come and bear witness to the insanity in person as Sacred Symbols conducts its first ever live show, co-hosted as always by Colin Moriarty and Chris Ray Gunn. All we can promise is that this episode will probably go off the rails at light speed or something close. Uh, 
Come ask questions, be silly, and revel in the might, the majesty, and the wonder that is Sacred Symbols. So as you can see from that description, entirely focused on PlayStation content. If you're familiar with Colin Moriarty as a personality, like most people that have a presence on the internet, he has detractors, he has fans. None of that comes up really in what was to be presented at PAX, which isn't to say that someone at PAX couldn't have decided to say, we don't want to be associated with Mr. Moriarty or Mr. Ray Gunn or, or whoever else that they might decide. They're running their own private uh, conference and they can decide yes or no about who is going to attend that conference. But here they have accepted the panel. This is the acceptance email. This is three weeks ago. And they have said, tell everybody that you're coming. These are all important facts to keep in mind as we discuss the issues here. It says also, if you have any additional special requirements, uh, please let us know. After you log in, you'll see any panels you've submitted and be able to edit it directly up until Tuesday, July 16th. There's that date again. After that date, things start getting published, so make sure it's perfect before then. They're going to start making materials, whether that's in the form of programs, brochures, uh, those little day drops that you sometimes get at conferences that say what's going to happen on the day and what various halls they're going to be in. They have to start printing those things a good chunk of time before the actual event, which I believe is at the end of August and in early September. So that date should have been the date where they would know if there was a conflict, if there was a problem with any of the content. Maybe they have two people that want to give the same type of panel uh, and they only want to have one PlayStation panel. All of that should have been apparent upwards of two weeks ago. Uh, and that's part of the story here as we talk about what wound up happening. That's the email that Colin got uh, that same day, only a couple hours later. He says, hello, thank you so much for allowing us to do the Sacred Symbols Live. We're so excited. We're in, obviously. Uh, and I'll make sure to get everything sorted on your website to make sure that the final description is up and running by that July 16th date. He was essentially accepting uh, the offer uh, that they would be able to have this panel that is tentatively scheduled for what would have been the Monday uh, at 11.30 uh, a.m. Unfortunately, if you followed this at all on Twitter, on social media, you've seen what's happening, uh, that panel uh, isn't going to occur. And we see here uh, on my Twitter, this is what actually raised the issue for me when I was looking at it yesterday. We've got a tweet from Colin Moriarty that says, PAX West rescinded Sacred Symbols panel today. So if you were planning to go, sorry, I asked why and I'm waiting on a response. And he tied an image to what he uh, apparently received from the PAX team on this point. It says, hello, Colin. Apologies, but we unfortunately have to remove your panel from the PAX West 2019 schedule. We apologize for any confusion and are happy to still issue special guest badges to you and the folks who are designated as speakers. So you will still have access to the show for all four days. And I actually skipped that when we were looking at the email, but that's one of the perks that you get for presenting a panel at PAX. That was in the end of their email. It said, all of your speakers on this panel will get a, a badge for full attendance uh, at the conference. And so what they're saying here is, we're canceling your panel, but you're still going to get your free badge. Uh, and that's an important part of the story as well, because when we start talking about what the elements of a contract are, one of them is consideration. And, and potentially, if you start having problems with your contract, whether or not you've experienced damages is part of the question. And so if they offered you these four free badges and they're still giving you these four free badges, to some extent, they're trying to get out in front of you potentially making any kind of damage claim against them. They say, hey, you're still getting what you were supposed to get, but... There's an ancillary part of this. There's additional expenses. There's costs. There's logistics. There's potentially asking for days off work or uh, hotel rooms or plane flights and things of that nature, which are, of course, going to be damages if you were only going to PAX because of this panel. If you weren't otherwise going to be attending PAX West, but you're a huge fan of Colin Moriarty and Sacred Symbols, and you said, hey, I'm going to go to PAX West and... PAX has as part of their email to Colin to say, hey, go tell everybody you're going to be at PAX West because, hey, frankly, from our perspective, that's really good advertising for us. If you have a fan base, if you have a built in number of people that might otherwise come and follow you out here, probably if you're PAX, that's one of the reasons we accepted the panel in the first place. You're famous. You're Internet famous. You're better than Internet famous. And now we want you to bring some of that fan base here because butts in the seats is a very important metric for a conference. But since that's not happening, we go a little bit further in the story. We have Colin here saying he responded. Can I be given a reason? I've already bought plane tickets, got a hotel, rallied my audience to go. People acquired passes to see us. Please let me know as soon as you can. And that raises the question of what was actually communicated here, which was essentially nothing. 
we unfortunately have to remove your panel from the PAX West 2019 schedule. That's not a terribly good explanation. That's not even a cursory explanation. They could have said, hey, we overbooked. Hey, we've got somebody that's doing a PlayStation panel. They could even say, hey, we don't like you, or we don't like a tweet that you made yesterday, or whatever it might be. Lord knows Colin Moriarty and probably Chris Reagan, I don't follow him, say things on social media all the time that are of a somewhat uh, potentially abrupt nature, that have the potential to offend if you're so inclined to do so. And so if they pointed to something like that, they could at least make that kind of argument. But they don't. They don't want any kind of exposure on those grounds because that's something that you could fight against. That's something that you could rally against, to use Colin's phrasing. And by not giving that kind of example, that's trying to kind of cut that off at the pass. You, you don't give Colin or anybody else anything to fight against, either psychologically, emotionally, or otherwise. So they don't give a reason. He doesn't have a reason. This continues for a while. This is when I ask him if I could see the email that we just talked about in virtual legality uh, because I thought uh, it was interesting. Uh, and then he winds up sending an email earlier uh, today, uh, which I've got on this next tab here. Uh, that essentially asks for a follow-up, asks for more information. It says, I'm reaching out a third time to inquire why Sacred Symbols was canceled at the last minute. We aren't interested in being where we're not wanted. We're not asking you to reconsider, but why did you cancel it? How can our people get a refund? How can we, how can we be reimbursed for expenses? We don't think we're owed a panel. We simply think we're owed professionalism. I've been advised that under the legal standard of promissory estoppel, your organization is indeed responsible for offering an avenue for refunds. And we're going to talk about promissory estoppel because that's actually why I'm doing this virtual legality episode today and about this particular issue because it's an interesting one. Promissory estoppel is a concept that is what we call in the law equitable in nature. It's not precisely legal. There are areas of the law that say, okay, even though we try to write everything on the page, even though we try to write everything in the statutes that we can think of, that we try to write everything in the contracts that we can think of, sometimes equity, sometimes the equitable nature of justice requires us to have essentially these kind of soft rules as part of our legislative and judicial process to allow for justice to be served even when it might not otherwise be under the strict rules of law. And, and one of the things that's coming up here is, you know, does Colin have a contract? Does anybody that signs a panel uh, with PAX or any other type of conference, do they actually have a contract when they submit a proposal to perform that panel at this conference? And I think we're going to look at the elements of the contract right now, but the answer to that is pretty clearly no. There's not a formal contract in place. The situation as it has occurred here is that PAX West essentially solicited proposals for panels, Colin responded by giving a proposal for a panel. Paxwex accepted that proposal and then offered them free tickets to the event, basically. Basically, that's what happens. And we look here at a definition on U.S. legal of elements of a contract, uh, which we're not going to get to in too much depth. But it says the requisite elements that must be established to demonstrate the formation of a legally binding contract are offer, acceptance, consideration, the mutuality of obligation, competence and capacity. You have to be competent enough to sign the document, whether that means you're old enough, whether it means you don't have uh, mental issues that would prevent you from being competent enough to sign a document and potentially a written instrument if it's big enough, if it's long enough. If you've got a contract that lasts for more than a year, most states are going to make you have it in writing, things of that nature. But what we're really focused on here is consideration. And, and what is consideration? If you're ever signed a contract in your life, or if you've ever uh, even kind of looked at an employee offer letter or things of that nature, consideration is the notion that each side has to give something up. That's what makes a contract legally binding. Um, so if you are buying a house, one side gives up the house and the other side gives up $100,000 or whatever the amount of money for the house is, and that's consideration. And if you're looking at contracts in a commercial setting, which, as you know, if you follow virtual legality, if you're a regular on this channel, I'm a corporate lawyer. I'm doing mergers and acquisitions. I'm helping companies get started, formed, funded, and hopefully exited at the end of the day. Those contracts all have generally recitations of consideration. They say as part of whatever it is that they're doing, in consideration for services rendered, in consideration of your entrance into this other obligation. That is important to establishing what a contract is. And here... You don't really have that kind of concept, uh, conceptually. You have Colin saying, hey, I'm willing to do a panel. And the other side saying, great, come do a panel. 
You might have an element of consideration for the fact that PAX is willing to give up free tickets to the event. And you could potentially have an element of consideration for saying, hey, I'm promising to come out there and perform this panel for essentially, you're not paying me labor costs, you're paying me these tickets. You might have a kind of contract there. That's a little bit of a tricky question. It certainly would be one that you could potentially bring up if you were going to pursue this as a legal action. But more than likely, it looks a little bit more like a quasi-contract that, hey, we've got two sides that are basically agreeing on a course of events, but it's not exactly a contract. And that's where promissory estoppel really comes in. I've pulled up Cornell's definitions for promissory estoppel, which are very light, and we're going to do a little bit uh, of a greater dive into what they actually say here. But their definition says, within contract law, promissory estoppel refers to the doctrine, it's not, it's not statutory, it's a doctrine, it's a precept, it's a philosophy, that a party may recover on the basis of a promise made when the party's reliance on that promise was reasonable, and the party attempting to recover det- detrimentally relied on the promise. So there's a ton of legal words there, right? But basically what we're saying is we're saying, hey, if one side of the coin here promised the other side of the coin that it would do something, it would allow you to have a panel at our conference. Because outside of you performing that labor for us, which might be consideration for a kind of contract, The real benefit to someone performing a panel is the publicity, the potential growth of their own audience, getting out there for marketing purposes. That's one of the reasons why you would do that, why you would have something like a Sacred Symbols panel, is because you want to appeal to your current fan base. You want to solidify your current customers, and you also want to grow that customer base. And so by denying you the opportunity of doing that, that's something bad. But outside of that, Just in terms of you agreeing to have me have the panel three weeks ago, I've taken certain steps to go and make that happen. I've taken the step of getting a flight ready for late August, early September to be at PAX West. If you're familiar with airplane travel in the United States, you know that even if Colin called up the airline right now and said, hey, actually, that's not going to happen. Can I just cancel my ticket? They'll say, absolutely, for a small change fee of probably a couple hundred bucks. And so... Colin's just out that money at that point in time. And the law says, okay, if PAX made this promise, and in all honesty, they should have known that there was an issue if there was one two weeks ago, certainly without any other explanation, we don't have any reason to believe there was something intervening in that time. But because they didn't make that determination, steps were taken in order to help fulfill their own obligations, in order to help get Chris and Colin down to uh, wherever it is in Washington then you should have known by making that promise to them that they would take those steps. And the law looks at that and says, well, if you knew that, and then you rescinded at the last minute, they've been damaged through no fault of their own, and maybe the law should do something about it. That's really what promissory estoppel is all about, is if it was reasonable, if you could predict as the promisor that they would take an action, and I think you can absolutely predict that hotel rooms would be would be bought and, and plane flights would be bought uh, and potentially equipment would be bought. You don't actually know that. It's a little bit the further afield you get from what's specifically required for what, what needs to happen to fulfill your obligations under this kind of exchange of promises, uh, the harder it is would be to prove those damages. But you should know that at least the flight and the hotels would have to be purchased. Then maybe they should owe you something if they... Welch on the thing if they if they rescind their promise at the last minute and we see here uh, an article from a from a law review article from uh, I think the 80s which I really just like describing the description of what's actually happening here at the very top I'm not going to read a 57 page law review article as part of this virtual legality I promise if I ever do that you can feel free to unsubscribe and, and go somewhere else but this says contracts are normally defined as freely chosen obligations supported by bargained for consideration. That's the easiest way to think of a contract, right? These are two people entering into agreement. They agree to each do something for the other, whether it's the payment of money in exchange for services or a house, exchange of promises, that kind of thing. Contract law holds the promisor to his word and gives the other party what was promised. That's a breach of contract. If you have a legal contract and the other side doesn't do what they said they were going to do, you can absolutely go into court and say, sir, that that party breached their contract. And so I am owed damages. I have been damaged by what they did, the breach that they did. Torts are violations of legally imposed obligations. Torts are different. Torts arise completely outside the concept of contracts. They arise 
primarily out of things like accidents and negligence. You've got to tort when you hit somebody with your car, that kind of thing, because these parties didn't know each other. They didn't bargain for what was going to happen. And the law still has to figure out how to make whole the party that was damaged. That's what a tort is, in case you hear it on Law and Order or on any other kind of legal drama that you hear uh, referenced. Torts is one of those fun words that is purely legal in concept. But now, having watched and listened to virtual legality, you know a little bit about what it is. Tort law forces the wrongdoer to compensate his victim for his loss. Okay, so that's contracts, that's torts. It goes on to say liability based on promissory estoppel does not fit neatly into either of these categories. As described in the restatement of contract section 90, these are treatises on which the states, the various states of the United States based a lot of their statutory law and a lot of their common law, their interpretations of how to deal with things. Liability is appropriate when the promisor should reasonably expect the promise to induce action or forbearance, stopping an action, by the promisee, and the promisee does induce such action or forbearance. If you could reasonably expect somebody to do something and that person does that something, then the law should have to deal with it, just as we talked about it. Liability is then imposed on the promisor to the extent necessary to avoid injustice. That's the concept of promissory estoppel. That's what we're talking about here. And before we get into the Washington jury instructions and commentary that I really think is useful to discussing this issue a bit further, I think it's important to note that this is distinct from PAX and PAX West and PAX East and E3 and Dice Tower Con or whatever conference you might be attending. This is a distinct question from should they be allowed to decide who their panelists are. 100% PAX West should be able to say, Colin Moriarty, Sacred Symbols, we are not interested in having you present at our conference. And they could do that for any reason or no reason. They could say, we don't like the color of your eyes. We don't like your political stances. We don't like how you shave your beard. They could do it for any reason. That is distinct from after having accepted the panel. What, if anything, should they be liable for for rescinding it a month out? And I think regardless of how you feel about Colin, about sacred symbols, about some other people that this might happen to, you have to take into account that these people could have possibly been damaged. And just from a pure justice perspective, just the economics of the thing, the law at least has to consider whether or not they shouldn't be afforded recompense for the damages, for the costs that they incurred. That's entirely separate from who they are as people. That's entirely separate from how you might feel about them. And if you have an issue about how you might feel about anybody in this particular story, just pick somebody that you really like on the opposite end of whatever spectrum that you're on and imagine that this happened to them and whether or not you would think that the conference should have to do something to make them whole. And I strongly suspect looking at this, you would think, Yes, probably, if they have lost money through no fault of their own, the law should probably do something about it. And that's really what equity is about, which is looking at these various things and saying, well, I think the law should probably do something about it. And so I look at this story and say, yeah, that's pretty much the same boat that I'm in. But what I found here was, and a lot of the West Coast states do this, and I really like it, Washington has put up its jury instructions for promissory estoppel. And this isn't terribly useful in so far as promissory estoppel is not a question that's often going to go to a jury uh, because equitable questions generally stay with the judge, stay with the court, and juries decide legal questions. And we could have a whole video and podcast about that at another time. But what these jury instructions are useful for is kind of breaking down the elements of what would need to have happened in order for Colin uh, to potentially have a decent promissory estoppel claim. And I used Washington here because PAX West is in Washington. There's a whole number of questions about what state's jurisdiction should apply if he were to bring a claim against these various entities because you've got Penny Arcade, you've got the Expo itself, which may have a subsidiary entity, you've got Reed Pop, where I don't even know where they're organized in. But certainly if he was expected to go to Washington, if the event was going to be in Washington, I think it very likely that you could potentially make a claim for Nexus in Washington, that there's there's a reason Washington state should have an interest in this particular claim. It's not a guarantee. I don't know the details, as I said in the middle of this video. This is not legal advice. This is purely informational. We're just talking about what happened. But when we look at these jury's instructions, let's look at how they describe this. Say promissory estoppel means that a person will be prevented, estopped. In case everybody was wondering what estoppel means, it means stopped. Uh, We just like to add ease to things uh, like eSports in law from denying liability for breaching his or her promise when another person reasonably relied upon that promise 
and justice requires that the promise be enforced. So it's exactly what we were talking about. Basically, Washington has a concept within its body of law that pretty purely adopts the concept of promissory estoppel as it was commented on in the restatement of contracts. It says the party asserting promissory estoppel has the burden of proving by preponderance of the evidence, which is the standard civil liability standard, each of the following, that the name of the promissor, and I'm going to fill these in after we do this first one with who we're actually talking about, made a promise of to specify promise claimed. So we would say that Pax West made a promise that sacred symbols would have a panel, that Pax West should reasonably have expected that promise to cause Colin Moriarty to change his position by purchasing hotel rooms, purchasing airplane flights, potentially purchasing additional equipment, depending on what the panel was going to be. That name of promise, so that Colin Moriarty did actually do that thing, did actually reserve flights, did actually reserve hotel uh, rooms. And that when Colin Moriarty changed his position, he was relying on the promise of Pax West and was justified in doing so. And we talk about justification in doing so. We see in that initial email that they said, go tell everybody, go tell all your fans that you're going to be there. They said, this is not something that is likely to be rescinded. They certainly didn't reserve that right in the actual email that they gave to Colin. They did specify that the, the scheduled time, 1130 on the Monday, was tentative. But I think the best reading of that particular bit of language in the email is that that tentativity is related to what the actual slot and room is. That it's not tentative that you are now going to have a panel at PAX West. It's tentative that it's going to be at 1130 on Monday in that particular room. That it might be 1230 on the Tuesday in a different room, but that you're going to have a panel at PAX West. And even there, if somebody's got a day pass and came solely for the panel, you might potentially have issues. But we're going to see what they've actually put in their legal language facing the actual ticket holders that might get them out of a lot of the liability to everyone but Colin and Chris and sacred symbols. But that when Colin changed his position, he was relying on Pax West, he was justified in doing so, and that that injustice, whatever injustice was related to his having relied on the promise, can only be avoided if the promise is enforced. Now, this is a little bit distinct from what we'd actually be asking for, I think, or at least as Colin describes what he is asking for. The promise being enforced is something different. That's saying, hey, we think that because we have detrimentally relied on this and maybe we can't fix it with money, maybe it was something other than hotel rooms and plane flights, because we can't fix it in that way, you actually have to fulfill your promise. Uh, and that's a harder burden. That's tougher to go ask a court to say, hey, you should make PAX West have us on their panel. And especially when you're talking about personal services, when you're talking about something that actually involves labor, uh, like having a panel at a conference, that's a tough road to go down with a court. It's easier if you're going to make a claim somewhat like this, and jury instructions can be changed, this is only a form, to say, hey, we don't need the promise to be enforced, but we need some damages for the promise not being enforced. And so let's take a look at the comments here. This is a great bit of uh, documentation. If you're at all interested in this, I will, as with everything else in virtual legality, link it in the description to the video on YouTube. Uh, but I've highlighted a few things that are of particular interest. It says, the WPI committee, which is the Washington Committee on Making These Kinds of Jury Instructions, believes that because of the equitable nature of promissory estoppel, the issue will generally be decided by the court. In other words, we made these jury instructions, but we're not sure that anybody should ever use them uh, because the court should mostly be making this determination on its own. We have a whole description of the role of the jury, etc. With regard to element five, if justice can be avoided only by enforcement of the promise, they specifically highlight this section of the restatement of contracts, and it says that satisfaction of the requirement may depend on the reasonableness of the promisee's reliance, on its definitive and substantial character in relation to the remedy sought, on the formality with which the promise is made, on the extent to which the deterrent and channeling functions of form are met by the commercial setting or otherwise, and on the extent to which such other policies as the enforcement of bargains and the prevention of unjust enrichment are relevant. Which, hey, welcome to your mini law school class on virtual legality. This is a lot of language from Contracts 101. But basically what they're saying is, hey, when you're thinking about whether justice will be served by enforcing this promise, or, or in this case, what we're talking about by going and getting damages, you have to look at a bunch of stuff. You have to look at how serious was the promise. Are we talking about two guys over a pool table essentially making promises to each other? Or this is a lot formaler. This is a corporation with an email chain. This is, this is pretty formal. 
Uh, and so does the state have an interest in enforcing something that looks a lot like a contract? We're 80% of the way there towards what a contract might formally look like. Deterrent and channeling functions are specific functions of contract. Do we want to enforce this promise because it will help deter future breaches uh, and that it will, will channel the way people make agreements into the proper forms? Uh, and on the extent to which such other policies as enforcement of unjust enrichment are relevant, if we allowed this to go, is PAX unjustly enriched? I think you could make that argument. I think you could make the argument if you're Colin Moriarty or if you're a Colin's Last Stand or Sacred Symbols, you could say, hey, you told me to go tell all my fans that I'm going to have an event there. I told all my fans, at least on the margin, at least a handful, maybe a couple handful, maybe more than that, bought tickets to your event solely because I was told by you to tell them that I was coming. And now that I am not coming, you know, what are you doing for them? And the answer right now is nothing. But when we talk about would justice be served, the question is entirely related to the fact that, hey, Pax West made a promise. They told me to go and publicize that promise. And now when they rescind it, I think that the, 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 the trouble, the damages that relate to that promise, they shouldn't sit on me. If I'm Colin, they should sit on Pax West. And the courts could look at that and say, hey, you're right. They could also look at it and say, yeah, well, you know, it's pretty weak claim and we really don't want to enforce these things in this way. That's what equitable means. Mostly equitable means what kind of judge did you get and how are they feeling that day? And you're trying to portray yourself as uh, the, the stepped upon, because if you're going to ask for an equitable remedy, you essentially have to say the other side was a bad actor and that in order for justice to be served, you need to, you need to make me whole. It says the Washington Supreme Court has also noted that promissory estoppel is similar to estoppel by silence in that in either case, the party who is estopped has in effect stood by and in violation of his duty and equity and good conscience to warn the other of the real facts permitted the latter to take some action detrimental to his own interest. This comes up because of that timeline, right? If Pax was going to cancel sacred symbols, when did they know they were going to do it? They were supposed to be publishing materials that were going to be present at the conference as early as July 16th, but they didn't tell Colin and Sacred Symbols that there wasn't going to be a conference, there wasn't going to be a panel at their conference until July 30th, two weeks later. And in that case, any expenses that were made in that intervening time, I would say you've got a pretty good claim about because Pax West should have known, in this case, warn another of the real facts that there was an issue here. The, the, the law essentially imposes once you know that your promise isn't going to be held, you have a duty to say it as soon as possible. And maybe they've got evidence that says, hey, we only decided this today and here's the reason why we decided it. But because they didn't give any reasons, because they didn't communicate those to Colin, we're left looking at this issue and saying, well, I mean, what reasons could they have? And if they had any reasons, they should have been apparent a, a significant time ago. The last thing I wanted to pull out from these instructions is third parties, because we're going to talk about the people that have otherwise bought tickets to this event, not Colin, not Sacred Symbols, not Chris, whoever, that they bought these tickets to go see them. And in the very particular case that they can make, if there are people that this actually applies to, that they wouldn't have bought these tickets if it wasn't for this panel. This actually says, regarding a potential claim by a third party as opposed to a promisee, so those ticket holders as opposed to Colin, See the restatement of contracts, which explains if a promise is made to one party for the benefit of another, it is often foreseeable that the beneficiary will rely on the promise. In other words, by Pax saying to Colin, yes, you can have a panel. Go tell your people that you will have a panel. It is implicit that the promise made to Colin was for the benefit of his people as well as Colin himself. And it will be foreseeable, at least as this interpretation, which isn't binding. This is just kind of commentary on how the courts should think about it, how jury instructions should potentially be phrased, that the third party should get the benefit of whatever the breach of promise is. That's going to be an even harder case than Collins and sacred symbols. And we're going to look at why that is as we look at the liability and legal information for the PAX page. And this, I believe, is done by Reed Pop. It's not exactly clear who the author of this document is, but I've highlighted the specific issues that are a problem. The events, operating hours, schedules, Guests and speakers are subject to change or cancellation without notice. In other words, if you bought a PAX ticket, one of the things that you agreed to by, by purchasing that PAX ticket, and that's not to say that it's right, it's not to say that you have to agree that this is the way it should be, is that the terms and conditions of that ticket or that, hey, that panel that you really wanted to, be see, wanted to see could be canceled. 
that, uh, that event that you really wanted to go to, those guests that you really wanted to get an autographed picture with, they might not show up. And ordinarily, you put this language in, and I've put it in terms and conditions that I've drafted for clients before. You put this language in because of exactly what I just mentioned, people not showing up. You know, if you really want to get a picture with Luke Skywalker and Mark Hamill has the cold that day, the, the event organizers have to make sure that they aren't suddenly liable for the fact that Mark Hamill got sick. And that's pretty normal. And that's a normal thing. You expect that from an event. That's not unusual to have this language in here. You don't need to blame PAX for having this language in here. It's designed to prevent those unforeseeable circumstances and to prevent their liability for things that are outside their control. Of course, if you were negotiating this contract, if everybody that purchased a ticket had a lawyer and was negotiating the terms of their agreement with PAX West, you would put those kinds of things in there. Okay, this is fine. As long as it's out, it's outside your control, it's as long as you give us notice, potentially you have a prorated refund, those kinds of concepts. Those aren't in here because they don't need to be in here. This is what we call a contract of adhesion, which we discussed in prior episodes of virtual legality. And in fact, we discussed detrimental reliance in a joking way in connection with the, the, the betting controversy over at Easy Allies, which is a funny video if you want to check it out uh, here on virtual legality as well. It's a bit of a parody or, or satire video about what happened with respect to Easy Allies betting, but it has the same kind of concept. We talked about uh, them having betting rules that they changed at the last minute and the fact that in this case, the fictional money that they were betting was wrongfully taken from some of the people that bet on the rules that they had put forth. And should they not have it be brought back? And I advocate in that video, again, in a joking tongue in cheek manner, that of course they should, that you have to follow the rules that you put forth. And in this case, PAX West should have to follow the rules that they put forth. And for the most part, outside of this language, and this is going to be problematic for the people that bought tickets and relied on those ticket purchases for this purpose, that outside of this language, you should say, hey, yeah, PAX West, you did something bad here. That people detrimentally relied on your promise. You encouraged people to detrimentally rely on your promise by having Colin advertise for you that he was going to be there and that Sacred Symbols was going to be there. And maybe this should really only apply to things like Mark Hamill getting sick, to things that are outside your control. It's not intended to apply to you personally as the organizing entity canceling the panel at the last minute. That's fully within your control. And maybe you could make a claim. You could make an argument like that to a court if you wanted to. But I will tell you right now, that bit of language in there, uh, and we've got additional language here that says subject to availability, access is not guaranteed, which kind of uh, buttresses that language. Uh, that's going to make it very hard for the actual ticket purchasers. That the, the standard conference applied, the terms and conditions for the purchase of the ticket applied, means you were never guaranteed a specific panel. And in the future, the law might say, you should know of these things. And you shouldn't be buying tickets to a conference solely for one panel uh, because that panel might not happen. And you're not going to have redress against the organizers of the conference because the law would view that as unfair. Because there are so many instances where things have to shift around, where people get uh, hit by a bus, where they have a movie contract come up all of a sudden, whatever it might be, where they suddenly don't show up at the conference that you thought they might otherwise be at. So I think the people that are Collins fans, the people that are Sacred Symbols fans, that have been put in this position, unfortunately have a much more limited claim than the actual sacred symbols folks, Colin and Chris, and whoever else might be involved in their production. Uh, and that's an unfortunate fact of how this all works. I think it's a useful kind of warning. Uh, and, and I hope that if you are a fan of those things and you've gotten to this point in the video or podcast of virtual legality, uh, you, you take it under advisement for future purchases, uh, but that this can happen at virtually any conference. Uh, this could happen at Celebration. This could happen at uh, E3. Uh, I don't know that E3 does panels necessarily, but anything that has this kind of panel component where you're going there to see something specifically, uh, it could be canceled uh, on a moment's notice. I, I can virtually guarantee that every single set of terms and conditions you look for something like a conference ticket or a concert ticket, uh, especially concerts that have a, a large uh, number of bands uh, that might drop out at the last minute, they are all going to say something like this, that, that they're subject to change, they're subject to cancellation, and you should be purchasing your ticket essentially for the whole conference and that we will be presenting something good, but it might not be the exact something uh, that you hoped to go see. So detrimental reliance, promissory estoppel, uh, they're useful. Uh, they're useful for sacred symbols and Colin Moriarty in particular. Uh, and if he wanted to d decide to go and seek legal counsel for these kinds of things, I suspect he would get uh, similar commentary, obviously uh, specifically fashioned towards his particular circumstances and with more detail uh, than I can go into here. Uh, but while that might be useful for 
uh, a Colin and sacred symbols. I- I'm afraid at the end of the day for everybody else, the ancillary beneficiaries, they're going to have a significant problem uh, because they did enter into a formal contract in the form of terms and conditions for their tickets. And that formal contract specifically excluded the ability for them to make claims based on cancellations, even if the cancellation was at the behest of the actual organizers of the event. And I say that not because it's specifically expressly allowed in those contract terms, but because it's not expressly disclaimed. They're not prohibited from doing something like that. It applies to all cancellations regardless of reason. And so I look at that and I say, well, that's going to be a problem. Um, And so that's really virtual legality for today. Again, I think it's important to separate however you might feel about Sacred Symbols, Colin Moriarty, Kind of Funny, IGN, whoever else. From this kind of discussion, we here in virtual legality like to talk about the rules of law, the rules of contract, the business and law of video games, information technology and software kind of independent of the personalities at play. And I would recommend that you do that. And again, like I said in the middle of this video, if you try to reverse it to whoever else you might like better than Colin, if that's the case, uh, I think you might find uh, uh, it, uh, it making more sense as to why there should be potentially some redress. Uh, so it'll be interesting to follow. I will continue to follow. Uh, Colin on Twitter to see how this progresses, see if he gets any answers from PAX West about why this is happening. Uh, But otherwise, if you enjoyed this video, please like, please subscribe to the channel. We are talking about these kinds of things all the time. We essentially had gambling week here on Virtual Legality last week where we talked about the UK saying that loot boxes and the like aren't gambling, why Grand Theft Auto V probably isn't gambling, even though it looks a lot like gambling to a lot of folks, what regulations should be done about it, if any, uh, those kinds of things. And we also cover pop pop culture. We do postmortems of all the Game of Thrones episodes, of Avengers, of The Lion King, all these kinds of things. We have a lot of fun on this channel. So if you do like it, please like, please subscribe, please share it around with anybody you might find interested in these materials. That always helps grow the channel, helps us have good discussions in the comments. And if you have your own comments, if you have your own thoughts on why I'm wrong or why I'm right about this analysis, about Colin's situation, about PAX West in general, Penny Arcade, whatever it might be, Leave those comments in this uh, video because I love having those conversations regardless of whether you tell me uh, if I'm wrong or if I'm an idiot or otherwise. Uh, Otherwise, thank you so much for watching this video if you watched it on YouTube. And thank you so much for listening to it if you listened to it on a podcast service. If you did listen to it on a podcast service, if you could go so far as to review it on the service you listened to it on and leave a comment, uh, that would be very much appreciated. That really helps us grow the channel in those specific avenues. Uh, And... Thank you so much for watching and or listening, and I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality.